What, Jen? What's in the chat? I don't know. Oh. <laughs> so, okay, so uh, Barbara said that Justine had a heart attack when she sent her the title with no context. <laughs> For a brief call, I thought she was talking about somebody legitimately having. I, I was too, and I, especially because, yeah, yeah. Okay, so we'll, we'll leave it there. Thank you, Barbara. <laughs> okay. Um, so quickly, uh, I want to talk just uh, just some dates because this is a story story of Christmas and not just Jewish engagement Christmas, but Christmas in America is a story of Jewish immigration, or at least Jewish immigration plays a role in it. Um, so I want to quickly sort of sketch out these waves of Jewish immigration. When we look at immigration in America for any group of people, we it tends to come in various waves, right? Where where people will be part of, from any given region, be part of these different, uh, um, yeah, well, waves. That's why I use the word wave, right? So the first the first one, the very first one is a Sephardic uh, wave of immigration. I wouldn't really call it a wave. It's people who are who have uh, gener a couple of generations prior have fled the Inquisition, um, but are now sort of seeking uh, a living in the new world in the English colonies. So these are mostly Sephardic Jews. Um, I believe the first Sephardic synagogue is in, I want to say, Rhode Island, I believe. Um, then there is a way, that's from 1650 to 1710, approximately. Then you have the West, Western Ashkenazim. So these are Ashkenazi Jews from primarily Germany and also, uh, you know, other parts of Northern and Western Europe. Uh, and they immigrate to the United States between 1840 and approximately 1910, 1915. And then there, and this is the one that is relevant to this story, the wave of uh, Eastern Ashkenazim. I'm sorry, I'm closing, I'm I, uh, moving uh, your images for a moment so I can see the slide. Eastern Ashkenazim refer to those Jews who immigrated primarily from the Pale of Settlements between 1880 and 1924. And then you have the post Shoah. Uh, uh, immigrants, right? Primarily from the Soviet Union in the 1980s and the 1990s, although there are some initially a small number after the Holocaust. And that may surprise us, but there's a reason why there's a sm only a small number and why most immigrants end up immigrating to what is then, Pal uh, then the British Mandate of Palestine and will become Israel. Uh, and this is the reason why. Come on. Okay. It's because of this thing called the Natural Origins Act of 1924. So again, deep history, I'm gonna try not to bore you, just gonna quickly go over the stuff, get to the more interesting stuff. What happens in 1924 is that there is severe restriction on immigration from pretty much the entire entire world. From our perspective, it's it's for, you, you see it from uh, uh, Jews and Italian Catholics, we're talking about approximately 85 to 90 percent of immigrants from Italy and from uh, Russia and from the Pale of Settlement and from Eastern Europe are denied entrance or denied entrance visas. Um, and usually it's connected to their ethnic identity, that being ethnic those who are ethnically Jewish and those who are ethnically Italian. Um, and there is a near total ban, like 98 to 99 percent a ban on immigration from the Middle East and from Asia. And that includes all both East Asia and also South Asia. So pretty much, and, and, and this will continue. This ban will be in place. The, the Natural Origins Act of 1924 is in place until 1965, where there is an, a huge lessening of immigration restrictions, primarily from, uh, from Asia, from both the Middle East, South Asia, East Asia and Southeast Asia, um, but also other parts of the world as well. Now. Maybe asking, well, what about those Jews who came over after the Holocaust? And yes, more entrance visas, more immigration entrance visas were granted to Jews after the Holocaust, not really to many other people, but to, to Jews. But it wasn't a huge amount. Most Holocaust uh, survivors end up moving to what will become Israel. Uh, so this sense of isolationism, this isolationist uh, uh, act, this anti-immigration act continues until 1965. And you can imagine that because this is like a, a nativist, it, it, this, this act comes about because of rising nativism that corresponds with the rise of the Ku Klux Klan in the 1920s. Because of that, where immigrants end up in the United States are places that are cramped, 
are impoverished and are heavily marginalized. All of us know this. We know about the Lower East Side of, uh, and we know about Brooklyn and we know about uh, these parts of these urban cities. We know about the Jewish experience in there. We don't necessarily know, always know about other experiences in those places as well. Oh, okay. Oh, right. Thank you for alerting me. Uh, can you remove my other Zoom tile? Oop, okay, cool. I, I think it's fine, Hillary. <laughs> no, no, I'm just messing with you. Okay. Um, I do I do want to also, I always mention this when I talk about immigration and religion, regardless of the context. Uh, I want to also, in addition to the act itself, I want to um, bring attention to these other two events that happened during the war. Uh, the first one, the most obvious one, is the Japanese internment, right, of, of, of Japanese uh, citizens in uh, concentration camps, like, you know, throughout much of, I mean, these are not the camps like in Nazi Europe, but they are concentration camps. They're prison camps. The other one, the other event, immigration event that I want to note is the uh, is the SS St. Louis, right, which is a ship that has Jewish Holocaust survivors that is fleeing uh, Nazi Europe, and it docks in Cuba, which the U.S. controls at the time, and ultimately the U.S., our country, turns away this ship, and it ultimately is sent back to Europe, right? I want to say around half of the, um, about half of the uh, uh, folks on the ship make it to the UK um, and survive the war and the other half end up in France. And I don't know the exact number, but I, I believe most of them end up dying or at least being sent to uh, the Nazi concentration camp system. Okay. You're like, what does this have to do with Christmas? Okay, before we get to Al Jolson, sorry, just blackface. All right. Um, now, where do these Jewish immigrants wind up? They wind up mostly, many of them, in New York City. And what do they do for a living? Well, they have to do something because jobs are scarce. This is sort of intentional, that jobs are scarce. You have lots of these European immigrants who are competing with one another. And they also, at the same time, are competing with another immigrant group that's coming into these cities as well. And I will sort of, and basically, this is this happens, this movement into the United States by primarily Jewish, but also Italian immigrants is happening at the same time as the great migration north among former, uh, the descendants of former slaves, right? Most often, many from sharecropper families who are moving into northern cities in order to, uh, to seek economic advancement. And so what ends up happening is there's this sort of crucible, this maelstrom of competition for resources and competition for jobs uh, that, that does result in significant racial and ethnic strife, but also results in some pr in, 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 in the creation of what we might today call popular culture, American popular culture. So the, the, the creation of music and art and so on and so forth as these cultures sort of come together. Uh, that is a very rosy, uh, the, the rosy side of looking at this. There is a negative side to this as well that we'll come to. But the creation of music happens in this place called Tin Pan Alley. I know you all know Tin Pan Alley. You've all heard this um, to a certain degree. This is where you have these multiple generations of Jewish song leaders, or, or song leaders, excuse me, songwriters. Uh, some of them are immigrants. Some of them are the children of immigrants. I believe Tin Pan Alley continues like well into like the 1960s and 70s. I think I heard a uh, an NPR documentary, I want to say on, on Neil Diamond recently, and he got his start in Tin Pan Alley. Um, and when there is so little work to be had, and when you have all of these immigrant communities competing, then one of the ways that some of these uh, immigrants sort of got out or tried to get out of poverty, but was going into the music business and creating art and creating uh, and using that as a springboard out of poverty. So uh, Sammy Khan, who is a songwriter, a Jewish songwriter, or this is what he says. He puts it, the ghetto, um, in this case, the Lower East Side ghetto, is the cradle, meaning the cradle of this music, the, cra the cradle of uh, creativity that will lead to jazz, basically, is what we're talking. We're talking about jazz. It's the cradle of jazz because the struggle is to get out of the ghetto. And in our country, it comes in waves, meaning immigration, right? And creativity along with it. So the creativity comes in waves along with the immigration. What I find fascinating about the Sammy Khan quote is that uh, this is something, a sentiment that you will hear 
during the 1990s in the hip hop world, right? With almost the exact same language, right? It's out of the ghetto where, uh, the, the, out of trying to get out of this impoverished and oftentimes violent situation uh, that that like art can, can I don't want to say thrive as if like the impoverished, impover impover as if the poverty is a good thing, but yes, art does come out of that. And that's something that's happening here. So we have multi-generations of Jewish songwriters uh, most arriving during this Eastern wave uh, from 1880, like onward. And so here's, here are some of them, right? So like Gershwin, Sammy Kahn, Burton Lane, Irving Berlin, who we'll talk about a little bit later, and many more in future generations. Like I said, Neil Diamond also gets his start in, uh, in Tin Pan Alley. Uh, so most of them live on the Lower East Side, and this is cr it's crowded, there's no money, there's no jobs. And because of that, this sort of music emerges as sort of a uh, a necessity. So have any of you heard of um, the Tenement Singers? Do you know what those are? Yeah. So Tenement Singers were, this is a little bit later, this is there during the Depression, where uh, not always Jewish, but many of them Jewish uh, vocalists would go among the New York tenements and sing, right? And people would throw a penny down or throw some food down to them or something like that. And that's how they made their living, right? All right. So... Mm -hmm. So, so uh, wandering minstrel. Okay. Literally. Oh, okay. I thought you. I, I just heard the word minstrel, and I thought I was like, "Oh, no, 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 no." They were no. no it was just badly timed. A badly timed term. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, and I, I, I say badly timed because minstrelsy uh, is a reference to black or blackface refers to minstrelsy. So, the jazz age is the time we're talking about here, and. This is a time of sort of um, interaction between these Jewish immigrants and artists and also black artists and immigrants who are coming up from the South, right? Because this is during the height of the, the, jazz, the jazz age is the great migration, right? It's the same time frame. And so the story of the Jews in Tin Pan Alley is really tied up with these stories of immigration, race, and religion in America. And you can say, well, why is that the case? And the reason is because you have, there is, Jewish and black collaboration on music and art in this in New York during this time that ultimately results in popular music and popular culture and popular art forms in America, most specifically, most specifically jazz. And then of course, out of jazz and also out of the Great Migration will come like the blues and eventually our, um, uh, uh, rock and roll and R&B and so on and so forth, right? All of these popular musics and popular art forms come out of this crucible and this interaction of culture. But the problem, the problem that arises is that it isn't always on equal footing, right? Because what, what everybody is trying to do in this time frame is engage in, a, in social advancement. But because the Jewish immigrants, especially their children, because, or those who have been here a while, because they do not have darker skin, right? It is easier for them to advance. I'm not saying it's easy to advance. I'm saying it is easier to advance. And some of them will do this by, by either appropriating or stealing the work of uh, black artists, not all of them, but some of them do this, or by leveraging a caricature of blackness in order to in order to uh, pr produce entertainment, right? So this is what Al Jolson does. Al Jolson famously in The Jazz Singer puts on blackface. This is, you know, and it, it's part of the story. And the story, it's the story of someone who, I mean, I know there's a lot more to it than this, but someone who becomes American essentially, makes it in the business, but also has this tension with his Jewish background. But the vehicle by which he does that is through blackface. And this is not the only time that Al Jolson does blackface. It's not the only time. He, do, he, he, he does it relatively regularly and he is not the only Jewish artist to do it. Um, I think Eddie Cantor does it a few times. I know that there's others who do it as well. It is a fairly common thing. And the thing about the thing about minstrelsy, about blackface during this time is one of the things that these Jewish artists do is they see themselves not necessarily as just making fun of black folk, although that is what they're doing. I want to be really clear about that, but that's not how they see it. They see it as they're identifying. And we hear this a lot when we hear people like put on like red face and they go to like a, uh, um, you know, a, a, you know, what's the new powwow? Uh, yeah. Yeah. Or uh, the new, uh, new, uh, 
uh, the new Washington team. What are they called now? I forget. Oh. Yeah. So, so formerly with their former under when it was, you know, it was their named the, 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 uh, the anti-indigenous slur. Um, people would do that and say, oh, I'm just honoring. I'm just honoring the culture. And this is something, this is sort of, I don't know if these artists would have said that, but there's, because of our Jewish background in, um, in, uh, 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 like oppression, there's this like, sense of identifying with blackness, but at the same time, identifying with blackness and using that blackness or the public perception of black blackness to advance yourself in the arts. Right. And, and so there is this weird tension between Jewishness and race and art that's happening during this time frame. And this does relate to Christmas. We will get there. Um, I promise you that. But what you need to take away from that is that so this is partially an expression of identity, identifying with a historically maligned people. But because Jews are not quite white, but also a little more white, they're a we are able to become more upwardly mobile, which is something that uh, are that, that their black counterparts, our black counterparts, are not able to do during this time. Uh, so, but at the same time, what is Al Jolt? What is he doing? He also is. He even though he does this, the jazz singer popularizes jazz for and and black culture. I'm not saying not in necessarily a good way, but it still brings awareness to this cultural art form, not not minstrelsy, but although but jazz specifically, right, it brings a degree of awareness and sort of and, and, and turns this into a popular culture, a popular culture that is taking from black culture. It is appropriative to be sure, but also because of this, it becomes more popular. John, you had a question and can we give John the mic so everyone can hear? Yeah, and uh, There's a little button on oh, the side. Oh, oh, there we go. Okay. Yeah, um, one of the things about Jolson, too, is like his act was incredibly racist mm -hmm. with stuff like this. But behind the scenes, he also did a lot of civil, early civil rights stuff, too. Yeah. Including like helping to foster the career of Cab Calloway and mm -hmm. a bunch of other artists and fighting segregation of spaces. So it's yeah. like a very odd. It is a tension. It, it, there's a tension. There's a liminality to it, a betwixt and betweenness, which is itself reflective of the Jewish place in America. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and so, yeah. So, so. He he does do what John says. He also popularizes jazz and he popularizes black culture. Um, but he does this through the use of blackface and through the romantization of this sort of picturesque notion of what the South was like during slavery and a picturesque notion of, of, of what American history is like. So um, if you have a chance, I want you to go look up when you have a chance, waiting on the Robert E. Lee on uh on youtube okay so this is this is it's written by uh wolfie gilbert who is another jewish writer popularized by jolson have any of you heard waiting on the robert e lee it is a these are the lyrics it's incredibly by today's standards incredibly racist i'm not just say problematic it is racist um it is and, and and um and jolson is using kind of like an affected almost not sort of quasi black African American accent when he sings it. It's definitely an affected accent. And it's and it's creating this um this really false image of what slavery was like. It's making it seem like everyone was happy. Um and you know there's there you know while they're sending the cotton down they're they're playing banjos and they're singing. And then at the same time he puts in these names, right? Ephraim and Sammy. What are very Jewish names, and so scholars have have argued that, and there's other songs where he uses these names as well. Our scholars have argued, Jewish scholars, study scholars have argued that what he's doing and what other artists are doing, what Gilbert and 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 uh, and Jolson are doing, is that they're trying to create an identification of Jews with Black Americans and Jews with Blackness, but they're doing it in this sort of what today we would call sort of an icky way. That's like in, uh, I don't think it was my phone. Oh. oh. Do you want to, uh, Alexis, can I give you the, the mic? Yeah, but I can talk pretty loud. Can you all hear Alexis or should she use the mic? No, I can talk. I have to sit too close. That's like a, 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 a
a Marx Brothers movie, I don't remember which one it is, I don't know if it's Horse Feathers or not, where they go down and there's the, they have this whole scene where yeah. Marx Brothers go in and are interacting uh -huh. with these extremely poor. Yeah. But happy and go yeah. lucky. So, so yeah. Alexis yeah. is referring to a Mar I forget which Marx Brothers movie yeah. it is, but there was a Marx Brothers. Yeah, so it's a similar thing that's happening. And these are Jewish artists who are doing this. And yeah, they're using this American pastime, this American uh, entertainment pastime, white pastime of minstrelsy. But there's also this sense of identification, which means, so what this tells us is that there's this drive among these Jewish artists to sort of figure out their place. And they're trying to figure out where they land on the American racial spectrum and how they can sort of create their own Jewish identity in this new place that is both separate from their identity in Europe, the identity of the oppressed identity, but also, which is an interesting parallel because there's Zionist discourse about that at the same time, but also trying to figure out what their new identity as they have a degree of acceptance that they have not had before, even as immigrants, they have more acceptance than their black neighbors. Right. Mm -hmm. And so they're trying to sort of figure this, figure this out and work this out. So my 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 uh, my advisor in graduate school, Michael Alexander, he writes this really fascinating book called Jazz Age Jews. It's about Al Jolson and uh, also Arnold Rothstein, who was like the uh, the famous mobster. So if you ever have a chance to read Jazz Age Jews, it's actually accessible. You should check it out. It's not overly scholarly. He writes uh, if African-American and, 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 and he's. He's, he he argues that Jolson and others are also kind of reaching back to an ancient like Israelite pastoralism where there is this sort of Jewish golden age of uh, of Israel uh, the Israelites before the fall of the temple when they were working the land right and they're and they're identifying the Israelites with both the Israelites enslaved in Egypt and also in Israel yes uh, is that speak loud too. John uh, is going to speak loud. Hopefully we'll hear him. Is that also like um, probably like parallel with the early Zionists? Yes. To go to Palestine and work the land like your ancestors did? Yeah, it's absolutely parallel with early Zionism, right? With the new Jew Zionism, right? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. So, but, but in this particular case, you have these other people who are here and are in this place that Jews have historically been in, but are not in. So you have the, whereas the early Zionists are going to be like, we're going to remake ourselves and remake the land, which is a whole nother discussion. Um, where they, while they're doing that, the Jews in the United States are, see this other group of people that are, have, are, are in this position. They're like, wait a minute, that was our position. Where are we right now? Should we identify with them or should we try to become white? What do we do, right? No one's asking this consciously, but it's coming out in their art and their writing. Sherry. Uh, yeah, let's give her the uh, yeah. yeah. Can't hear her. Yeah, yeah. She. I just gave her the uh, the the not the remote. Can you hear her now? Press the button. Hold on, y'all. You're saying they took advantage of black artists. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Jazz. So. And, and, and they and the people who um, were writing songs in the beginning, they made very little. Yeah. So uh, what? So it would. Uh, which we're having some trouble with the mic. So I'll tell you all online real fast. What Sherry was saying, absolutely correctly, is that some of these artists will eventually become producers. So so uh, Sammy Can is one of them. And there are others as well. And what they'll end up doing sort of in the next generation of artists and uh, and music production is they will they will actively steal uh, black music, right? And pass it off as white music or not give uh, rights of the music to the black artists or uh, underpay them and things like that. And this will be an ongoing issue. And it's still discussed today when we talk about whether stars uh, from marginalized groups, stars of color, stars who are women, who are uh, music stars or, uh, or, or actors or whatever the case may be, whether or not they're paid enough. Right. That is an outgrowth of this early sort of thing. And so when I we talk about like Jewish involvement in uh in, in in American popular culture, 
a lot of it is a very good and fascinating and something to be proud of, right? But but there is a there is a dark side to it too. There is exploitation that's happening, and I think like anything, like I said last week, it's important to understand this sort of uh, history. So Irving Berlin, oh. Irving Berlin, also protege of Tin Tan Alley. His 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 uh, his he, he he's born Israel Baleen. He changes it to a less Jewish sounding uh, Irving Berlin, uh, which is so so common with uh, Jews in the industry. Still is common. In fact, I think we had a conversation about this in our uh, one of the, our classes that we had last year. Um, and he's also part of Tin Pan Alley, but he does something totally different. He's not interested in identifying with Black culture or Black suffering or oppression or history per se. I don't know if he was personally what he felt about it, but um, at least in his art, he's not interested in doing that. His art is reflective of what he does with his name. His art is about assimilation. His art is about is about becoming American and being as American as possible. This is why he's oftentimes, oftentimes called the great American songwriter, right? Because American music of this time period, when you think about it, you think about Irving Berlin. Because he wrote so much of it. He wrote so much of it. So what he does is he departs from the early jazz age uh, performers and their identification with Black culture. He is all about tapping into the mainstream. And through that, through that, allowing Jews to tap into whiteness, not blackness, but whiteness. Um, now, this is not to say that he was a white supremacist, right? Um, this is not to say that he was, I, I, and I know um, many of you like know this sort of discourse. Some of you may not know this discourse and that's why I'm making these clarifications. Um, what he would have seen was how do I and how do we make it in this world? And in the United States, especially during this time period, one of the ways you make it is by aligning yourself as much as you can with the mainstream culture, which is especially in the 1920s and 30s. And when, if I ever do a class on religion and science, we talk about race science, we'll talk about this. During um, the 1920s and 30s, it is a very white supremacist culture, right? Absolutely. There's no question about that. And so in order to make it, to get out of the tenements, you have to, if you're able to, you you align with this. Now, not everyone does this. There are certainly Jews who are like, no, this is wrong. This is insidious. We can't be doing this. Um, so you do have a choice. There's a choice that's being made, of course. But Good. the choice that uh, that is being made uh, with Berlin is to align with mainstream society. I don't know if he would have seen that as, you know, we need, I, I want to make us white. I don't know if that's what he would have thought. But I do think he saw what mainstream society and mainstream culture, and it was like, I want to be a part of that. Yeah. Was there a question? I thought I heard someone ask a question on I that. A comment, Sean? Yes, Janine. Uh, you know, Irving Berlin was not totally out of the realm of creating um, racial and derogatory songs. Um, some of what he wrote were called what they called coon songs. Yeah. C-O-O-N, which were, again, uh, very, you know, humiliating, anti, anti-Black. So he wasn't totally out of that, out of that realm of, of doing the, the same type of thing. Thank you. Thank you for adding that, Janine. I really appreciate that. So if you couldn't hear, I'm going to, I'm going to, um, there, there is a type of music that's being used and it, it has a slur in it, right? So they're called coon songs. Um, these songs are associated with minstrelsy. Right, they're songs that are used by, and they and there had been this sort of song like well in, like in the nineteenth century and onward. So an early minstrelsy where it's like you know just like performers going from camp to camp around the fire. That's where it starts, and then it becomes part of ragtime, and then it makes its way into the jazz age. And I didn't know that Berlin was used was doing them as well. And so thank you for bringing that up. That's helpful. That's helpful to know. So is not innocent of this, right? And it's not necessarily fully unknown. He's doing it somewhat intentionally. And, but what the main way that he does this, the main way that he seeks to replace Jewish alienation and a Jewish sense of, of separation from everyone else and tap into the mainstream or tap into whiteness is by creating uh, patriotic standards. So uh, standards, excuse me. So like all out of step, but Jim, where like this, the song about like the soldier Jim, who is uh, he's marching in step with the music and then everyone else is out of step. And of course, Jim is the one who's really out of step, um, which also says something about maybe his own sense of like 
again, alienation and getting through this, right? But most famously, of course, is God Bless America. Um, and and I don't know if any of you have seen the, the film, This is the Army, where at the end, uh, the, you know, there's uh, what's her, Kate Smith, I think is the name of the artist who sings God Bless America. And there's all these patriotic Main Street scenes. And it's really, really fascinating. And, and if you look at the names here, right? Look who's, look who's one of the stars. Yeah, Lieutenant Ronald Reagan. Right. So this is how American this is the army is. And it's one of the and it's and this is how American God bless America is. Yeah. 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 But but uh, yeah. Yeah. But it's written. I don't it's, it's made during the war, but it is written. God bless America is written in 1918. Yeah. Um. So he writes these patriotic standards because he notices that the way to tap into American culture is through. American militarism and American patriotism. And that's the way he does it, right? So he seeks to do this full-throated embrace of this dominant American culture, but he shifts it up a little bit. Interestingly enough, he shifts it at the eve, at the very beginning of the American involvement in the Second World War. And he doesn't write what, at least on its surface, is a patriotic song. He doesn't write, which is this, this military you know, fanfare song that has to do with the army. He writes something different. He writes right, White Christmas. It is patriotic because White Christmas, remember our involvement in the war, takes place right after the bombings of Pearl Harbor. So Americans are sort of seeing themselves in the sort of this darkest hour. They're looking for something to pin their hopes on or they're looking for something to get their mind off of, off of both the bombing of uh, Pearl Harbor and also the fact that this heretofore relatively isolationist culture, remember, this was isolationist from 1925, um, is now entering into a war that most Americans didn't want to be in, um, at least to start off with. Now, as Jews, we like, you know, we look at the show and we're like, and we and then there's a narrative that America tells itself now, which is that we were the heroes of the war. Um, and that is that that there are parts things that can be support that can be supported and also things of that that cannot be supported. Um, I don't want to get too much into that right now, but basically at the time, Americans didn't want, my point is to say Americans didn't want to go into the war. So it's written 18 days after Pearl Harbor. He writes it on Christmas Day, right? And um, in 1941, it's recorded in 1942, and then it is played for American and uh, American soldiers who are being deployed uh, in those early days of American involvement in January, February, March of uh, of, of that time. And you may ask yourself, well, wait a minute, Christmas is in December. Why is it being play, uh, played in March? It's not just that Christmas goes you know, further back. Um, I was thinking about that, though. And I remember that in March of 2020, I remember that I had neighbors who were putting up Christmas lights because it was making them feel better, right? And I saw a couple articles about that, that in the, 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 the pandemic was starting, people were putting up Christmas lights so they could sort of go back to this time, December of 2019, when and be comforted by that sort of tangible uh, or visible uh, remembrance of something that's better. White Christmas is an auditory reference to at least what is imagined by mainstream and mostly white Americans and Christian Americans at the time, to be sure, as a time that was better, a better time, a time when things were simpler, when things were almost... Uh, um, What's the word? Uh, bucolic, right? So you think about White Christmas. You think about the imagery. It's this nostalgia for white America, right? This nostalgia for America. We don't think of it as white America now. We all hear it. There are plenty of black Americans who sing White Christmas. Uh, there are Americans of every race and ethnicity who love White Christmas. We don't think about it this way now. And maybe Berlin was, or maybe he wasn't thinking about it, but these are the emotions that are being brought up at the time. So think about it, right? A bucolic time in the past, a nostalgia for something that didn't ever really existed, certainly didn't exist for, honestly, for most white people, this didn't exist. This existed, the imagery of white Christmas existed for a small handful, maybe, of Eastern seaboard, upper class whites, right? Probably in New England, primarily. Mostly New Englanders. This is who and maybe like upstate New York, right? This is this is who actually maybe for a time lived White Christmas. They probably were all singing tuberculosis at the time, but like that's not part of the song. 
Um, so, but, but this is the imagery, treetops and sleigh bells. And just like the ones, the Christmases I used to know, just like the ones I used to know. What that means, it would, or at least what scholars have, have interpreted this to mean, is that, it, 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 and the reason it resonates, is because it means before the war, before the bombing, before the depression, before the great migration, right? Before immigration, before all these things that have come into the country and changed it, these were the positive Christmases of the past. Back and when things were good. When the, Barbara says when things in were good. In air quotes. What's that? And she puts in, in air, air quotes. quotes. Yeah. Yes. When things were good. And this is like language that we still often hear in these appeals to a nostalgic past. And oftentimes these appeals to a nostalgic past are heavily weighted and heavily fraught with um, with with racial reasoning, frankly, right? Oftentimes. But one of the things, but again, Berlin is an immigrant. He's an immigrant. He is from one of, at the time, one of the most hated and marginalized, he's not, not the most marginalized group, but one of the top five, to be sure. Yeah, John. I was thinking the, the Christmases that Israel Belain probably knew before he immigrated were probably pogroms. Yeah. So, so John says for those online, uh, the uh, the the uh, Christmases that Israel Beline knew before he immigrated were pogroms, right? We immigrated from Russia, and yet here he is tapping into this. So he taps into this nostalgia. It comforts people, but it comforts people with sort of like you know these ideas of of a past that never existed. And then it also it also at the same time because it's not just him. He also wants to bring the Jewish community, or at least his music, through his music, wants to bring the Jewish community into mainstream whiteness. He sanitizes Christmas of the, both his Jewishness, there's nothing Jewish about this Christmas song, but there's also nothing Christian about it. So it creates a, it's evocative of this mythic non-Christian Christmas, right, that even Jews can participate in. Now, by and large, Jews have well, no. I mean, a bunch of you raised your hand when you're talking about the music, and I'm sure that one of the songs you like is White Christmas. Yeah, right? You think of the movie. Okay, the movie the no. Yeah. And and so, uh, one second, John. So, yeah, the, uh, for those online, everyone just mentioned, uh, Sandra just mentioned the movie um, and sort of, uh, and, and how, how good the movie is. And so this, and that's true, right? But what Berlin is doing is he's trying to create an identification with Christmas, Making an American, but that also means an acceptance of white identity and white respectability. There we go. Okay. So, uh, Barbara, go ahead. Oh, that's just not my uh, kind of Christmas music at all. So, that's, what, what, out of curiosity, what is your kind of Christmas music? Uh, 15th and 16th century. <laughs> okay. 15th and 16th century, like, like English? Christmas music? Yeah, like Coventry Carol oh, and yeah. stuff like that. Well, there, there were no Jews in England then. They had been, no. they had been expelled. No, exactly. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to say that. Oh, it's there. true, though. Oh, we got someone in the chat. Oh, okay. It's oh. just me. Oh. oh. Okay. So I, have a I just want to I, I put this image up here. This is from the film. This is also, this is not from the era. This is a, a Thomas Kincaid painting. But Thomas Kincaid's painting, what he do, what he did... Um, before he he passed away a number of years ago, he would create these very iconic bucolic uh, pastoral images of an American past that oftentimes were criticized as erasing the uh, the sort of the racial strife and tension and very and problems of America during this time period. And what I find very interesting in this particular image of these two images juxtaposed against each other is like is is this sort of bucolic whiteness that's being presented both in the film and in this later painting. They're not connected to each other. I'm just using this to illustrate a point. Uh, John and then Daryl. I know also one of the things that like white supremacists especially like to say is that um, like the secularization of Christmas is some insidious Jewish plot. Yes. It, yeah, I'm actually going to, yeah. Stuff, like, white yeah. Um, I, I sort of I talk about that on a later slide, but I'll, I'll mention that really right now. And then Daryl, I'll give the floor to you. Um, what John mentioned is that that white supremacists will often say that White Christmas and other uh, other songs like Rudolph, for instance, are an insidious Jewish plot to take Jesus out of Christmas. Right. 
Um, also, there were uh, folks who during the 1920s, as you would start to see uh, 1920s and 30s, 40s, and 50s, where Jews started owning like department stores and, and the uh, commercialization of Christmas took off. P Jews were accused of commercializing Christmas as part of this sort of plot in order to enrich their coffers as department store owners. Daryl, go ahead. One of the things that sort of fascinates me is why we associate Christmas and snow when, uh, first of all, most of the country doesn't have it. But even in New England, typically the snow is not all of them. Don't happen until after Christmas. Uh, yeah, that's a very good question. I don't think it necessarily needs to be like scientifically accurate. I think that it's about creating an image of comfort, an image of beauty or what is seen, you know, what is perceived as being beautiful. And it, I'm not saying it's not beautiful. I think that those images are beautiful, even though that they even though they have a lot of baggage. Um, and again, creating like this bucolic, pastoral, comforting image. That's the purpose of it. And snow is not comfortable. I don't like being in snow. None of us like being in snow. That's why we're all living here. Or at least that's part of the reasons that we live here. Um, but nobody like looks at the uh, uh, these images and says, I really wish I was out in that snow. It's like, no, I want to be safe. I want to be safe, enclosed in these buildings where that warmth and light is coming out of while darkness and snow is on the outside, right? No, no. Some people like to see. I know people like this. <laughs> really? I don't understand. I, I, as, a, I, as a Jew, I would never ski. No, <laughs> yeah, I know that people like to ski. I totally get that. I'm just saying that the imagery, right? It's it's the imagery. Okay. I, I also would say that people ski in January and February. I had a comment also. Uh, yes, Janine. It's interesting going back to um, the White Christmas. Thinking about the amount of anti-Semitism during World War II. And the amount of the, the popularity of the song, it didn't seem to bother very many people that a Jewish person wrote a Christmas song. I mean, they all bought it and- Yeah. You know, I, I think that that's an excellent point. Um, it's, for those in the back, what Janine said, it didn't seem to bother people that a Jewish person wrote this Christmas song. And I think in that way, at least for Irving Berlin himself, I think that he uh, succeeded in sort of, at least as part of his legacy, tapping into that sense of mainstream Americanness. Um, when I teach this to my students at Long Beach State, even when there's theater students who know who Irving Berlin was, many of them don't know that he was Jewish because his name, right? His name doesn't sound particularly Jewish, right? Irving Berlin, it certainly doesn't sound like his previous name. It's not Israel, right? So yeah, I think to answer your question, no, people, people don't know, people don't know. Um, and I don't think they necessarily knew at the time. Because also he was a he was a known entity. He had proven himself with uh, with God Bless America. You know, you write God Bless America, you're legit. Of course, as John said, anti-Semites and white supremacists knew, and that certainly was never enough for them. All right. So I want I like to think of Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer as sort of bridging the gap here, right? So it's originally written as a poem. Uh, by the Jewish but fiercely secular Robert May. And he writes Rudolph the Red-Nosed Re Reindeer to tap into his sense of alienation, the poem at least, not the, uh, the song that will be written by his brother-in-law, Johnny Marks. So his feeling of being alienated and separate from Christian society, but still saying that I have something to give to society and yet I'm being like, I'm not being allowed to be part of this mainstream society, that, is what he pours that into the creation of this poem. And it is a reflection of his sense of difference, his sense of otherness from mainstream society, especially during the Christmas season. And I think that so many of us have felt that sense of otherness during the Christmas season. Um, so what happens in the song? Well, he Rudolph doesn't like get a nose job. I love that. I was I have never thought of that. But that was, I just thought of that joke and I'm gonna use it every time I teach this from now on. <laughs> that's the best joke that's the best joke i will ever tell in my life yeah i'm gonna, I'm gonna let me yeah <laughs> oh give me a break <laughs> um so yeah so he doesn't rudolph doesn't doesn't he doesn't get a nose job he doesn't get rid of his shining red nose he embraces it he embraces his otherness and because he embraces his otherness and embraces his true authentic self he 
meets with success. And sadly, this is actually the opposite of Johnny May's, excuse me, uh, Robert May's experience. He does not meet with success. Um, he, his poem goes, is, is widely ignored and reviled until it's picked up by his brother-in-law, um, Johnny Marks, who turns it into a song and makes it about, and, and Rudolph saves Christmas and it's a sort of jaunty song and he finds success. But one of the reasons he finds success is because there's nothing Jewish about the song and he himself in his life downplays his Jewishness significantly. He lives an incredibly, not just religiously secular life, but ethnically secular and culturally secular uh, life as well. So much so that his second wife, this is again, Johnny Marks who we're talking about, who makes the song. Uh, he, he, he is so secular that his second wife had no idea that he was Jewish until after he died. Yeah. That's that's how and that's a I know a lot of like very secular leaning Jews who have not have nothing to do with their identity, but the idea that their spouse would not know is is mind boggling, and and so and so that's that's, that's really really fascinating to me. And I, I was wondering about this, and I wonder like what else what else might it be in Rudolph the Red Nosed Reindeer that might appeal to Americanness, right? And it's the fact that that that. Basically, like if you look at Santa's like sort of being like doing business, right? It's delivering, you know, goods and toys and so on and so forth. Uh, basically, Rudolph is able to leverage his uh, his you know nose in order to uh, fulfill the day's work, right? So basically, that sense of American work ethic and capitalism, right? That's just you know, I'm not. That's just something I was idly speculating. I'm not saying that's an actual thing. Kind of an American individual. Yeah, American individualism. Yeah, it's the American. I think actually I like that better, Genevieve. Thank you. That's better than my sort of uh, ham-fisted, uh, quasi-Marxist uh, interpretation. Uh, it's it is it is an embrace of it was the embrace of individualism that that maybe made it popular. So really quickly, here's some other very famous uh, Jewish Christmas hits. Oh, I should say Johnny Marks also did Holly Jolly Christmas, um, and I believe Rocking Around the Christmas Tree too. So. Silver Bells, uh, Jay Livingston, Ray Evans, Let It Snow, uh, Joel Stein, Sammy Canton, Winter Wonderland, Felix Bernard, Khan. I'm so sorry. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Jenna's the. Uh... Yeah. So I, I don't normally teach. I, I teach the I teach the race stuff. Right. And Jenna does the music. I, I told you you should have given the lecture. I told you. I, I, I gave I gave her the opportunity to give the lecture and she's like, no, 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 no. Yeah, they're all secular. Yeah, I, I've never seen a Jew write a, um, like, like, it wasn't a Jew who wrote uh, Oh Holy Night, you know? I heard Jenna sing it before. <laughs> yeah, I'm really good at it. <laughs> yeah. I'm so scandalized, Jenna, scandalized, I tell you. So, yeah. So I want to ask, is there is there a Jewish Christmas? What is the place of Jews in Christmas? I was looking at the cards and they had one that was a haunted Christmas. Christmaka? Christmaka. The Alexa saw Christmaka card. Yeah. So is there a Jewish Christmas? And in a way, yeah, because it's hard to get away from Christmas. If we're going to live as a... I imagine for Satmars... There is no Jewish Christmas. I imagine for <laughs> the Satmar Hasidim, right? Extreme, so, extreme. yeah. So I imagine I imagine for Lubavitchers who are not actively engaged with the larger Jewish community, I imagine there is no Jewish Christmas, right? Um, but for most Jews, from modern Orthodox on down secular... Satmars do middle mountain. Nidalnach. I'm not getting Nidalnach right now. <laughs> I'm sure from I'm sure for most Jews from modern Orthodox down, there is some engagement with the holiday. That's not to say that like secretly like Jews are like buying a Christmas ham. That's not what I'm saying. But I'm saying that like you know the whole thing about the Chinese food, right? Mm -hmm. Or going to a movie, or using like if, if there. I know that like when um, Jenna worked at an Orthodox school and Liana went to daycare there, they gave winter break off. They don't have to do that, mm -hmm. but they still did that because you still have to engage with the Christian calendar and the fact that everything else shuts down on the public holidays of Christmas and of New Year, right? Uh, you just have to engage with that. So just by nature of living in a Christian dominated society, we have to observe at least the calendar 
days of Christmas. We don't have to celebrate Christmas, but we can't mail things on Christmas. We can't go to the DMV on Christmas, right? We cannot do these things that on an ordinary day we would do. And that kind of, it, it is a type of light engagement with the holiday. It doesn't mean you're celebrating it, but it is an engagement with the holiday. You can't get around that. Um, yes, Sherry. Thank you. Yeah. They love to do that. So thank you. Thank you. So yes, um, I, I like to do that too. I was walking around I, and then that is also an engagement with the holiday. We don't necessarily, you're not necessarily putting them up, but you are, you are, as an American, you are engaging with the holiday and that's okay. That's completely fine. That is part of Jewish engagement with this holiday. There really is no one way that Jews celebrate Christmas. Some Jews do celebrate it. And I think we have to recognize that there are also interfaith families that are celebrating Christmas. Um, many of us do Chinese food, right? Which is a whole nother discussion. And there are, uh, there are, of course, because it's, you know, racial components to it, of course. Um, but that's for another day. Uh, but yeah, like th th this is absolutely part of it. Hold on. I'm going to just, I want to just quickly jump ahead to Hanukkah because we're almost done, but then uh, I'll open the floor. All right. So what about Hanukkah? What about Hanukkah? There's a President Obama lighting the menorah, which was a huge deal. I think that was the first time there was a menorah lit inside the White House, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. It has the little Statues of Liberty. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that cool? So... Just as <laughs> Sherry says it's expensive, the menorah. So just as America has kind of forced Jews to engage with Christmas, and just as Jews in America have influenced Christmas, Christmas in America would not be what it is today if not for Jews. Just because just like that, America has changed Hanukkah or has allowed us to change Hanukkah. This is syncretism in, in, in practice. America redefines Hanukkah. Um, Hanukkah in America is, it, 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 you have these areas of tension where what is it about, right? Is it about the menorah or is it about the Maccabees? So for the Mac, like the, 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 the war against Antiochus, this is much bigger deal in Israel than until recently was in America. This is changing a little bit right now, but historically in the United States, Hanukkah, the emphasis was on the oil story. It was on, and not just the idea of like, there's this miracle of the oil, but the idea of light, light emanating in the darkness. That resonates with Christmas themes. And in the United States, American Jews played that up for it to resonate with Christmas. Now we all say it's not Jewish Christmas. We all say that. We all say it's a separate thing. But the fact of the matter is there's a reason why Chabad puts a menorah next to Christmas trees. Christmas is in the background. You can't, Christmas is always in the background. You cannot celebrate the winter holiday without being aware of Christmas. Um, so, yeah, I, I'm sort of, I, I, I know that we're pretty much at an end today. I think I more or less uh, uh, made my point. I think we should, I, I think of Hanukkah not as Jewish Christmas, but as an American Jewish answer to American Christmas. That's at least how Hanukkah is in the United States. So uh, that pretty much ends for the day, but are there any last minute comments? Daryl. Um, just as a point about the brothers of Devon moving out on December 24th to celebrate Christmas, <laughs> and it's going to be Mithel Cohen Menorah. It looks like it's a good movie. So it, yeah, so thank you for the plug. Uh, and yes, um, so but that is that is also a way of celebrating Christmas. We don't think of it, we don't want to think of it that way, but we are you, you are celebrating, you are at least observing something on Christmas Eve, right? Um, and you're watching a movie that involves Christmas in yeah. some way. It has mistletoe in it. Written by a Jew. Written by a Jew. <laughs> Suzanne. <laughs> Daryl, can you pass the uh, the microphone backward? Um, 
tell a story that when our son was in college in North Dakota, oh. he worked at Best Buy. Mm -hmm. And one of his um, co workers came in, and I guess during the day she taught or well, as an aide at a nursery school, a preschool. And she was so excited to just mention that today uh, they taught the children about how Jews celebrate Christmas. <laughs> and I don't have to know about that. Well, my son called me all upset. He goes, oh my God, now those children think this. <laughs> and I told her that's wrong. And she goes, oh no, yes, they do. And he goes, and I told her, I'm Jewish. I would think I would know. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he calls me all upset. He says, oh my God, now those children are always going to think that. I had to explain to him that they're probably three and four years old and they weren't going to remember yeah. it the next day. <laughs> but he was just beside himself that that is what, yeah. that adult college student yeah. likes to yeah. Hey, that's a step up. Yeah. That's, what, that's what they were teaching. So I th thank you for that story. And I think so many of us have stories like that. I want to end today on a slightly more hopeful story that just happened recently uh, with us. So, uh, story no, this is, yeah, two weeks ago. So, now? no, so I yeah, know there are hopeful stories that happen occasionally. Yeah. <laughs> Here at least. Um, so uh, Liana, uh, her teacher uh, sent home like the holiday plans, right? Because these, you know, the, the, the class, I think it's the whole grade is doing these holiday plans. And for this week and next week, every day is a different holiday themed thing. So yesterday was Elf Day and they had to wear stripes and today was Santa Hat Day. And so the usual sort of thing. And we're looking at this and we're like getting increasingly annoyed. But at the same time, going through that sort of emotional um, navigation, which is like, do we want to really cause a stir about this? Like, you know, there's already issues with this particular teacher about unrelated stuff. Like, is it really worth it? And then we get to Friday of this week and it says Hanukkah day and everyone wears blue. And, and it's actually during Hanukkah. And it's during Hanukkah. It's the first day of Hanukkah. And we find a way always could find a way to find some sort of critique. Should they be doing it? It's a sacred day. Uh, what about other holidays like Diwali? We could find other ways to find to, to find a criticism. But ultimately, we looked at this, and I, as growing up, had never experienced anything like that. I was always outside. I think most of us who grew up Jewish experienced being outside, like Robert May uh, during the holiday season. We experienced that, of of, you know, so you're celebrating that Hanukkah thing, right? And maybe our mother came in and talked about how to spin a dreidel or something like that, right? But it, 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 is, there, it is, and even with that sort of recognition, there was always sort of a sense of alienation, better than being beaten, not being called a price killer, but like still, it's, it, you know, there's a sense of otherness that's happening. And I, I'm reading, I'm reading this and I'm thinking like, there's a thought that after my initial happiness of this goes through my head, it's like, wait a minute, do I want people who aren't Jewish dressing up in Hanukkah stuff. And then I thought to myself, no, in this particular instance, in this particular instance, how important it is for my daughter to, of these 10 days, to be the same as everybody else and to be accepted. And that is a testament to how far we have come. I know that we have a lot of work to do, but if that's not a holiday miracle in its own way, I don't know what is. Um, and on that, I will uh, bid everyone a, uh, a happy Hanukkah and happy holidays, if uh, as the case may be. Hug Sameach. Hug Sameach. And I will see, I mean, I'll see everyone on Friday, of course, if you're here. But in general, this class, I will give you an update on when we'll meet next, but it probably won't be until January. Oh, oh, oh yes, on Friday. Friday is Hanukkah. Bring your uh, Hanuki. Bring your menorahs. Bring your menorahs. <laughs> John says, "Can we should we bring our Hanukkiot? I, that is such a like it's such a modern like like term that like I know what it means, but no, it's bring your menorahs. <laughs> what about the? Do you know what song doesn't work? You guys say like let's all have a party. Let's light the Hanukkiah. It doesn't work that way. Are we having uh, lockers at Temple? Well, sorry, hold on. Oh, there's a online question. Are we having latkes? On are Friday? there Jen, Are there latkes at the Temple on Friday night? Yeah. No, there are no latkes. You can bring your own latkes." Okay. Um, ask ask Jenna if we're bringing our Hanukkiot on the following Friday. Does she know if Julie has a plan for that? Uh, does Julie have a plan for the following Friday? It's not Hanukkah. Oh yeah, it's not. That's the day. Yeah, yeah. It's, uh, Hanukkah is over at Sunstown on the following Friday. Plan as we I think.
Yeah. Yeah. So I, anyway, answering your question, no. Julie is not planning on doing anything. <laughs> Crap. Sean and I are gone okay. for the third and, Friday, yeah. third and, and Friday. Jen and I are gone for the third and fourth Friday of December. So, yeah. All right. Wait, hold on. Uh, Sherry, I'm going to close this down and then we'll all, yeah. Okay, everyone. I'll, everyone online, I will see you soon. Have a great holiday. Bye -bye. Thank you. It's been fun. Thanks for a good class. Thank you.